absolutely terrific. So happy to be here at Mount Hope and to be with you for this, for this missions launch and for all in. I'm so excited about what God is doing. If you've got your Bible or your iPad or your, or your smartphone, I'm going to be speaking from Matthew chapter 28, very familiar passage of scripture. That's a popular uh, text here, is it? <laughs> Matthew 28, uh, very popular scripture and uh, beginning 18 through 22. 18 through 22, is it through 22? 18 through, yeah, 18 through 20. Here's what the word of God has to say. Matthew 28, 18, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Let's bow our heads together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be in this great Mount Hope Church. And Lord, as every time I preach, I always pray, one more time, anoint me by your Holy Spirit to minister the Word of God with a demonstration of the power of God. I pray, dear God, that as I do so, that I might connect and that I might communicate to this congregation. Let them hear, dear Lord, the words that you want them to hear. I pray that it would inspire them. I pray that faith and generosity would well up within their spirits. Do all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And amen to God forevermore. Now, in this passage of Scripture, I really just want to draw your attention to two words. Two words. The first two words of Matthew uh, 28 and 19. Verse 19. The first two words say, therefore go. Therefore go. As Pastor mentioned, uh, I've been an Assemblies of God missionary for 39 years. And for these 39 years, my entire ministry has been an itinerant ministry. When I say itinerant ministry, that means that my ministry is one that has had me always traveling. I'm always on the road. I'm always traveling, uh, moving uh, on the field, open air, goodness, crusades all over the country, traveling from uh, different countries, always traveling. And, and I'm always on If I flew in yesterday here, I fly out tomorrow. In fact, let me tell you how much I travel. On one particular airline, Delta Airlines, besides all the other airlines I travel, Delta Airlines, in the seat, actual flown miles, I have flown five million miles with Delta Airlines. Now, let me put that in perspective. Five million miles is the equivalent of 10 round trips to the moon. And so I travel a lot. And, you know, invariably, I, 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 you know, I get on the plane and I sit down and invariably, the person sitting next to me wants to engage me in conversation. Sometimes I'm just worn out. And I say, Lord, just give me a break this time. Let the next person that sits by them open the four spiritual laws, work through the whole thing with them and all. But just give me a break this time. But they always want to engage in conversation. And finally, they always get to that inevitable question when they say to me, what do you do for a living? When I tell them I'm a missionary, suddenly they lose interest in the conversation. They want to lay back, take a little nap, read the airline magazine. I was on a flight one time, and I sat next to a man, and as we were taxing out and taking off, he started the conversation. Finally got to the question. He said, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a missionary. His response was very diff different than most. First, he just sat there a few moments. I could tell he was in deep thought. And then he turned to me, and he said something that nobody had ever said to me. He said, you know, it must be tough to be a missionary. I thought about that because I could tell he had given that a lot of thought. And I thought about my missionary career and I thought about some of the, some of the tough times. And there, there are tough times uh, in, 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 in being a missionary. I mean, our, our first term in Hong Kong, uh, my wife and I, we were just kids. We, had, uh, 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 we had, went to the field with our little daughter in our arms and we had a little boy born there in Hong Kong. And while I was in Hong Kong, I went into the hospital for, for gallbladder surgery. It's just very simple. I was supposed to be out in three days, but something went wrong. The doctor didn't know what happened. Something went wrong. My sister System paralyzed. I was in there for weeks. I was literally dying. God moved and did a miracle and, and restored my health. Two, two of the times we've had terrible automobile accidents with the entire family in the car. Every member of the car, the cars were destroyed. Every member of the family uh, that was in the car could have, could have been killed, but God did a miracle and preserved us all. 
For many years, I did open-air evangelistic uh, 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 meetings across the country of Thailand, and, and uh, uh, sometimes we go to areas that were hostile to the, to the gospel. I, was, I, I always preached up on a platform, kind of elevated, so that the people off in the distance could see me, and sometimes we'd be in areas the, the Buddhist monks would, would be resistant, and they would stir up the people. I'd been like preaching, and people would come up to the edge of the platform, and, and they would shake their fist, and they, and they would curse me, and they would threaten me. One time while I was preaching, while I was preaching, a bullet whizzed past my head. Fortunately, it had been thrown. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, were, they were poor people. They could afford the bullet, but not the gun. But, uh, but I knew what is in his heart, you know, and so, so I faced t tough times, you know, but then I began to think about that and all the great times. I turned to him and I said, you know what? I said, it's not been tough being a missionary. I said, in fact, it's been a pleasure to be a missionary. I got to my destination, I got to the hotel, and I couldn't get that out of my heart, a pleasure. So I sat down in the hotel, and I wrote out three pleasures of being a missionary. And I want to give that to you this morning. The first pleasure of being a missionary is the pleasure of anticipation. The pleasure of anticipation, that's when God first calls you to be a missionary. You know, a lot of people that, uh, that, are, that are missionaries, God calls them when they're in, in, in elementary school or, or maybe high school, some in college, but not for myself and my wife. God called us when we were already out of college and we were pastoring. I say out of college. My, my wife is a, an Italian girl from New Jersey and I'm a rebel from Georgia. And so we met at college and we got married. And when we, when we graduated, we went up to the panhandle of Florida and pastored, took a little church, a little church. I say a little church. A little church. We had 11 people on Easter. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a little church. And we weren't a city church. We were out in the country. We were so far out in the country, you had to drive toward town to go hunting. I mean, we were way out there. <laughs> but I mean, there's 11 people. I mean, we were just kids. I thought, Lord, how will I ever lead all these people? <laughs> But then we began to grow. And when we got up to about 50, I said, it's time to do a missions convention. So we had a missions convention. We didn't know how to do anything. And so I invited a missionary in and he did all the preaching and he led us in the faith promises. And so there we were in the faith promises. And I was, I was holding, I'd done this growing up in my home church. I did it at, 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 at Bible college, my wife at home church in Bible college. And now we we're holding the faith promise. This was different. This was in our church. And we we're so excited. And I held that faith promise card in my hand. And I said, Lord, what do you want us to do this time? And in a faith promise service, God spoke to my heart. And he said, this time, I want you. And I wrote in the faith promise card, Lord, we will go. But we couldn't go yet. Because in those days, the uh, requirements were very strict. You had to be at least 25 years of age. We weren't. You had to have pastored at least two years. I hadn't. And you had to be ordained. I wasn't ordained yet. And so we continued fulfilling the requirements, but God had called me. I mean, so we had the pleasure of anticipation. Every morning when I'd get up, I would, I would be thinking, I would be dreaming. God called us to the People's Republic of China. But in those days, you couldn't get into China. Foreigners couldn't get in China. So we purposed in our heart to go to Hong Kong. We get as close as we could, right on, the, right on the southern coastland. And so we were living that anticipation. God had called us to be missionaries. We, we prayed about it. We dreamed about it, too. We met the, the, uh, the qualifications, and we applied to headquarters, and, and and uh, they brought us up to interview us, and they proved us. And then we began the, the, the process. It's called itineration, when new missionaries were travel amongst the churches and tell what God has called them to do. And uh, I mean, with that pleasure of anticipation of going and fulfilling the call, we went to church. I don't think anybody's excited as a brand new, freshly appointed missionary traveling and telling their story. We're living that pleasure of anticipation. Finally, we raised our budget. We got on the plane, myself and my wife and our little daughter, Wendy, in our laps, and we flew halfway around the world to Hong Kong. I'll always remember as we were coming down to, to, to land in Hong Kong, we looked out the plane and see Hong Kong Island, and then just across the harbor, Kowloon Peninsula, and then the new territories of Hong Kong, and in the distance, the People's Republic of China. Our hearts leapt with the anticipation of fulfilling the call of God. 
we arrived, we went to the hotel that, or, or to, the, uh, to the apartment we'd stay in until we found our regular place. And, and then I enrolled in language school, myself and my wife. Chinese, Cantonese dialect of Chinese. It's a tonal language, seven different tones. So you can say one word, seven different tones gives it seven different meanings. And so our teacher, Dr. Chun, he wanted us to learn this really, really well. And so he led us like somebody leading music. He, he stood in front of us and he said, Nei Chong Chong Yi Sei Chang. I went, Nei Chong Chong Yi Sei Chang. He said, Nei Chong Chong Yi Sei Pen Guo. I went, Nei Chong Chong Yi Sei Pen Guo. He taught us to say, Do you like to eat an orange? Do you like to eat an apple? Hey, I was speaking Chinese. I mean, I. I went to the market. I wanted to use my newly learned Chinese. I went to the market to use it. You go to our apartment, there was fruit everywhere. <laughs> That's that pleasure of anticipation of learning the language, getting into the ministry. But then the pleasure of anticipation gives way to the pleasure of experience when you're doing it. I arrived in Hong Kong myself, my family, on my 27th birthday, June 29th. And I began to pray, Lord, somehow get us into China. You couldn't live in China, but you could, you could get in for short visits. And I prayed, Lord, Lord, God, get me into China. So by December, I was able to make a trip into China. And I began to pray, God, bring me into contact with the church. Many of you know the story of China. 1949, communist uh, uh, revolution came. Chairman Mao uh, led uh, the communists into power. There were less than a million believers in China, but Chairman Mao said, that's too many. There's no place for Christianity in this communist country. And so he did everything that he could to, to wipe out the, 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 the church. He, uh, uh, he, he, he uh, arrested pastors. They confiscated churches. They seized Bibles. They scattered believers. Uh, did everything they could and, and uh, 1966 to 76 was a cultural revolution where it was a especially intense sent hundreds of thousands of red guards uh, across the country looking for any vestige of counter-revolutionaryism if they found a man still preaching they arrested him if they found somebody still reading the bible they took it away found even a small group gathered together in the name of jesus they scattered them uh, uh, hundreds of miles in different directions 1975 chairman mao's wife says christianity is in the dustbin of Chinese history. It doesn't exist in China any longer. They thought they'd destroyed it, but they'd simply driven it underground. So I knew that uh, how China was and the, and the, and the, uh, the, the, the desperation and, and uh, the oppression. And so when I went into China in December, I began to pray, God, bring me into contact with the church. I was on a street corner and a Chinese man walked up to me and we kind of began to uh, get into conversation. I was excited to be using my newly acquired uh, uh, Chinese. And, and after conversing, conversing for a little while, both of us realized that the other was a Christian. And he said to me, would you like to go to my home tonight? We're going to be having a gathering of, uh, of, of, of Christians, a house fellowship. Would you like to come to my home for that tonight? I said, I would love to. So I went to his home, and as we conversed a little bit, they discovered that I was a minister. And so he said to me, he said, will you please teach us? I thought, teach you, teach you. Every time you gather together in the name of Jesus, you do so at the risk of the authorities coming in and hauling you off to prison. Every time you gather, I mean, you're risking your life and your liberty. Teach you. You people are heroes. You should be teaching me. But he said, Ma Moksi, Ma is my Chinese surname, Moksi means special. He said, Ma Moksi, teach us. So we sat on the floor as they do there, and I opened my Bible, sat there cross legged and, and uh, began to teach these people the pleasure of experience uh, there with these heroes, the men and women in China, teaching them from the word of God, encouraging them uh, uh, in their persecution, the pleasure of experience, doing it, fulfilling what God had called us to do. At one point, uh, 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 one of the guys said, Mama C said, you're an ordained minister, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. They said, you know our custom here in China. They said, uh, we can only be baptized by an ordained minister. They said, we don't have an ordained minister. Our ordained ministers are in prison. They said, you're an ordained minister. Will you baptize us? I tried to teach him. The Bible doesn't say you have to be ordained uh, to baptize. I tried to teach him. I said, uh, uh, elders, you baptize the younger. Parents, you baptize your children. But they wouldn't hear anything of it. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, uh, they said, Mom, see, uh, you, 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 we have our customs. You're ordained. How 
can you deny us baptism? I said, okay, I'll do it, but how, where? You can't go to a public place. You can't go to a river or stream. I said, I'll do it, but, but how? They said, don't worry, everything's under control. Somebody pulled out from under a counter an old tan wash tub. It's about this big around and it's about this deep. And they put it in the center of the room and they filled it with water. Well, I didn't know what to do, so I just went over and I knelt down next to it. They knelt down next to it and they made a line. The first one came up. I put my hand on his head. I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I mashed him as deep down into that wash tub as I could get him. I baptized the top half of 17 people. And then I began to think about that. I thought, now, I'm an Assemblies of God minister. And we in the Assemblies of God believe in baptism by total immersion. I thought, now that I baptized the top half, should I turn these people around? And uh, <laughs> you know what? I decided just to call the job done. <laughs> it didn't seem to matter to them. I don't think it mattered to God. <laughs> Experience doing it. We, for several years, our whole first term, we were in Hong Kong ministering, traveling in and out of the mainland of China. And then a missionary in Thailand who was doing open air crusade evangelism and church planting died. The work was very, very critical. And so our missions leadership, because the work was, uh, it was uh, the work in Thailand was very young and so it's a critical ministry. And so our missions leadership said, Ron, will you go over and take over the evangelistic meetings in the church planting. So I, I, I obeyed leadership, and so we went over there. And I stood, started doing these open-air meetings. Thailand, an overwhelmingly Buddhist country, probably the most Buddhist country in the world. But even today, three-tenths of one percent Christian. The vast majority of the peoples of Thailand had never heard the message of Jesus Christ. I wish I could tell you what it's like, friends, to stand under a starlit Thai night to stand on a platform elevated uh, amongst the people before a few hundred or sometimes a few thousand people who had never heard the message of Jesus Christ. Uh, almost all of them had never heard the name of Jesus Christ. To stand before those people and to tell them there is a God who made them uh, and who loves them. He gave his son Jesus who gave his life for them so that they might have forgiveness. You see, Buddhism uh, has sin, but it has no forgiveness. It has sin, but it has no repentance. Uh, Buddhism uh, is a merit-based religion, which means uh, they have to make merit uh, to outweigh uh, uh, the bad deeds of their life, a task which cannot be accomplished. Uh, and to stand in front of them, to say with all of your efforts to tip the scales, uh, to make sacrifices, uh, uh, to give uh, and do good things, uh, you, you cannot do it. But the good news is, is that Jesus paid it all. Uh, Jesus paid the price for your sin. He once and for all has made the sacrifice and under that high night given invitation and see people step out of the darkness of their lives and in so doing coming and inviting Jesus. Friends, people that when I led them in prayer after 10,000 and more unanswered prayers to the idols and the images and the spirits, they prayed the first prayer in their life that ever had an answer. When they followed after me and said, oh God, I never heard of you before, but I heard tonight and I believe. Take away my hurt, take away my pain, take away my sorrow, take away my sickness, take away my sin. And you could see literally the very moment that all of the demons that had moved into their lives as they worshiped at the spirit houses and the altars to the false gods and the demons came into them. You could see the very moment that all of those demons moved out because Jesus, the son of God, moved in to their lives. Oh, the pleasure of experience, doing it, telling those that have never heard, preaching the name of Jesus where it's never been preached, planting the cross of Christ where it's never been planted, establishing the church where it doesn't exist. 
Normally, when I do these, uh, these uh, Good News Crusades meetings, uh, the team would go ahead of me, and, and they get everything set up, and I would travel. And so one time we were doing a, a campaign about two and a half hours from Bangkok, where we lived, down at a place called Pattaya. And so they were there. They were all set up. I was getting ready to go down. And my daughter, Wendy, Wendy said to me, she said, Daddy, and she said, uh, uh, school was out. She said, can I go with you to the, to the crusade? And I said, well, sure, baby, you sure can. And so we're riding down there in the Speed the Light van. And, and she said to me, as we were riding down, she said, Daddy, could I sing? Could I sing in the crusade tonight? And I said, well, baby, I didn't even know that you sang. She said, well, I never have before. She said, but I've got a cassette tape. This was in the 80s. She said, I got a cassette tape. She had a cassette tape of Sandy Patty. Anybody remember Sandy Patty? Cassette tape of Sandy Patty. She said, I thought I'd play this and I would sing with it. I said, well, baby, you sure can. That night, my daughter, Wendy, stood on the platform in a beautiful little Thai outfit before several hundred lost Thai people. And she sang a duet with Sandy Patty, <laughs> mostly Sandy. <laughs> but as she stood there singing to the lost, something began to bubble in her little heart. And today, Wendy and her husband and their three children are missionaries in Southwest China, supported supported by this church. I was doing another crusade in uh, the northeast of Thailand, and, and uh, we're in Mukdahan on the banks of the Mekong River. Across the river was Savanakhet, the second largest city of communist Laos. Laos was hardline communist. We could not get in to Laos. But the river was not wide there. The language on the Thai side of the river was Isan. The people were ethnic Isan, which were an identical people group as the Lao people on the other side of the river. So the language was the same. So we turned a couple of the speakers over on this side of the platform. We turned them in the direction of the river and, uh, and Savanakhet, where the Lao people were. And so every night I would preach and I would stand and I'd preach to the Thai people on the Thai side. Then I would go over to the edge and I would look over at the Lao people and I would preach to them for a while. And I would say to the people on the Lao side, tonight when I give the invitation and people in Thailand over here come forward and they pray and they give their hearts to Jesus, you on the Lao side, you can follow after us with the prayer. And over there in Laos, you can give your hearts to Jesus too. And so as I would give the invitation, come forward, and I would lead them in the prayer, I would look over at the Lao side, and I could see their shoulders kind of rising and falling as they were saying the prayer after me. You see, uh, that com communist government could stop us from physically going, but they couldn't stop the sound of the gospel uh, from carrying across the river. <laughs> they couldn't stop the movement of the Holy Spirit penetrating the hearts of the Lao people and drawing them to Jesus. They couldn't stop the Lao people from making a commitment and giving their hearts to Jesus. You notice I move around a lot when I preach. Well, one night while I was there in Mukdahan, as I was preaching, I was kind of dragging my leg a little bit. You say, something wrong with your leg? No. I took my little son, Sam. He was about three, four years old. And I took him up country with me to the crusade. And uh, every evening he would sit out, uh, we had a big open altar area, and he'd sit kind of right in the front row on the ground with everybody else. One night as I was preaching, he must have looked around and realized he's the only little foreign kid, got a little spook, because he jumped up, he ran across the altar area, he ran up the steps on the front of the platform, he ran across the platform, and he leapt and landed on my leg, and he wrapped his arms and his legs around my leg. And so uh, it was preach a while, drag Sam a while, preach a while, drag Sam a while. But as I was preaching and Sam was wrapped around daddy's legs, hearing me preach the message of hope to the lost, something touched Sam's life. And today Sam and his wife and their three children are missionaries to Thailand where he grew up. And my youngest son, Matthew, and 
his wife and family are long-term missionary associates assigned to Northern Asia. The pleasure of experience, preaching the gospel, winning the lost, telling the untold, planning the church, raising your children to be in the family business. And then as the years go by and your hair turns white, as mine has, you look back with the pleasure of remembrance, with perspective, and you ask the question, Lord, did anything that I have done make a difference? I did the open air meetings in the church planting in Thailand for years, and then I opened Laos, the communist country. I went in, negotiated with the very president of the country, to come and establish Assemblies of God Ministries in 1989. And then I opened Cambodia, a heartbroken nation that has suffered so much. Went in there and walked the streets and negotiated with government officials, negotiated the opening of orphanages and clinics and schools to demonstrate the love of Jesus. March 1990. And just a month or two later into Vietnam and negotiated with the government our re entrance to all of our missionaries left in 75 when the South fell to the communist North. So, open Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. So, I was made an area director for a new area, Burma, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. And I, 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 gave, I gave up the, the, the crusade ministry in order to give leadership to all of this and, and establish the ministries. So, it had been a while since I'd been up to the Northeast where I planted the churches. So I called one of our missionaries, Kelly Robinette. I said, Kelly, you know, it's been a while since I've been up there at the churches. I play. I'd like to go up and visit again. He said, Ron, they'd love to have you. He said, I'll, 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 I'll set the itinerary. The first night, we were in a little village called Coxawan. Coxawan was just a little tiny village. We'd gone there and, and done an evangelistic campaign, and the gospel took hold, and we planted a church. And so that night, we were in the church, and they had the worship. They all sat on the floor there. And we had worship, and it was precious. And then the pastor got up. And normally, the pastor, in introducing me, would say, He would say, we're so happy to have Reverend Ron with us tonight. But he didn't say that. He said, He, instead of saying, Pastor Ron, he said, we're so glad to have Father Ron with us tonight. Father Ron. Paul, Paul is the word for father, Paul Ron. Now, Paul, father, that's not like a, in a religious sense, like a, like a priest. It's father like in the respected elder sense. He said, we're so glad to have father Ron with us tonight. He said, Paul Ron is our father in the Lord and the father of our church. He said, when Paul Ron came, we were worshiping Buddha and he brought us Jesus. Let me tell you something, friends. That'll make you feel really good. Really good. But then he went on. And he said, No, Jack, none. Potter on God, moon cup, akaratut, palo. He said, Besides that, he said, Father Ron is like the Apostle Paul. Like the Apostle Paul. Now I'm really feeling good. He said he's like the Apostle Paul. He came and he brought us Jesus and he planted our church. He said now he's in other countries planting other churches like the Apostle Paul. He said, but the Apostle Paul wrote letters back. He said, but Father Ron never did. So you know how kind of they'll bring you just right up here and then they just got to bring you right back down to reality. Oh, it was just wonderful. So I preached. And then afterward, they rolled out the rattan mat and they put out the food and we sat on the floor as typical there and we were eating. As we were doing, I began to look around. And it'd, been, it'd been a while since I'd been there and I noticed some people missing. And I said, what about brother so-and-so? They said, oh, a couple of years ago, passed away in heaven. I said, well, what about brother so-and-so? A while back, passed away. He's with the Lord now. I noticed that mother Songkiet, meh Songkiet, 
was, was, I said, Mass don't get you and I. Where's Mother Song get? They said, oh, a while back, she passed away. She's with Jesus. The next night, we were in Nawa. Nawa was the first crusade that I ever preached. The first church that I planted in Thailand. The service was wonderful. It was so much the same. And afterward, they rolled out the rattan mat. They put the food down, and we were sitting and eating, fellowshipping. And again, I looked around, and I noticed people missing. I said, where's brother so-and-so? And I said, he's with, with Jesus. Where's sister so-and-so? Passed away in heaven. And then I noticed that Mother Neum, Meniam, was missing. I said, Meniam, you and I, where's Mother Neum? They said, oh, watch on Ron. They said about six months ago, Meniam passed away. She's in the arms of Jesus. And suddenly, it dawned on me. The reason that we had come, the reason we left family and friends, sold all our furniture, left our homeland, brought our little daughter, the reason we had left and traveled half a world away had been realized in the lives of those people. We found them at the feet of Buddha and we brought them to the foot of the cross. From darkness to light, from earth to glory, they had made the journey. And we could say, we've been successful. We've been successful. We moved on, I was area director several years, established ministries in those countries. And then in 2000, I was asked to return to our original call to become the first area director for a new region called Northern Asia. The only country in the region was the People's Republic of China so that we could have a new vision and a new singular uh, outlook and establish in a more successful way and bring more missionaries in. God has made our dreams come true. I told you earlier when God called us as we were pastoring that little church in the Faith Promise Service. And so I was so excited. Every day when I woke up, I was dreaming in my heart about going to the mission field. But one day I was out cutting the grass. And as I was cutting the grass, God opened up in front of me what I could only describe to you as a living dream. It was as real as you are sitting in front of me. I saw a platform, and the platform was set up next to a temple. Just in front of the platform were hundreds of Asian people. In the distance were rice paddies and water buffaloes and palm trees. And I was on that platform with the microphone in my hand preaching to those people. I couldn't quite understand it because we were going to Hong Kong, which is a great urban city. That time, five million people, now seven million. The mainland of China, you couldn't do ministry like that. I couldn't quite understand it. But after our term in Hong Kong, we were called to go over to do the open air meetings in Thailand. The first meeting in Nawa, the town I described to you, everything was set up. They brought me in behind the platform. We had a big screen, a big movie screen, because we'd show films to draw the crowd. And so they brought me up behind, and I couldn't see anything because of the big screen. I came up the steps from the rear. I went around the edge of the screen, and I walked into the front of the platform. And there was my dream. There was the Buddhist temple they had hired. They had leased the land from the temple to do the crusade. There were hundreds of Thai people. And I was looking in the distance, the rice paddies and the water buffaloes and the palm trees. My dream came true. Why? How? Because people just like you in a faith promise service just like this one held a faith promise card in their hand a card that as you hold that faith promise card in your hand is just paper and ink. 
But when you read as God enables me, I will. And you fill out what God has spoken to your heart. That faith promise card stops being paper and ink. And it becomes a love letter to the lost. As you say, God loves you. And so do I. This is what I'm going to do to make your dreams come true. You see, the unreached have dreams too. They lay down in the darkness of their light at night and in the emptiness of their heart, plagued by demon spirits, empty, a vacuum where Jesus is supposed to fill. And they dream of hope and help and a way out when we respond with our faith promises to support the missionaries who go to the bleeding edge of evangelism to the most lost the least told when you fill out that faith promise card and then give as God provides you make their dreams come true God bless you, Pastor, as you come back. Amen.